Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central and today I want to do a true story episode about how Chris Cornell of Soundgarden defied Guns N' Roses management. Now I've uncovered a new interview with Chris Cornell from years back where he talked about touring with Guns N' Roses and how the management of Guns N' Roses and their whole team kind of were making decisions for the band that even some of the band members may not have been aware of and how it could have made the band look bad. So we'll get to the interview in a bit, but let's set things up a bit. So on the User Illusion tour that Guns N' Roses did from 1991 to 93, um, what was interesting is a lot of the supporting bands on each leg of the tour were pretty much big acts in their own right. Skid Row, Nine Inch Nails, Smashing Pumpkins, Blind Melon, Faith No More, Motorhead, all there for the same reason, to have a good time. Now, not quite everyone felt the same way, though. So Faith No More's keyboardist Roddy Bottom described the scene backstage as excess, excess, and more excess. He said there were more strippers than road crew, and eventually Faith No More was reprimanded for laughing about the absurdity of touring environment with Guns N' Roses, and they basically told the press about it. So basically, Faith No More were told they had to apologize to Axel or leave the tour, Basically, we made an attempt to explain where we were coming from, but I think it went over his head because as a sort of peace offering, he brought us to his trailer backstage where two naked women strippers were having sex. Another band that was on tour with Guns N' Roses was Soundgarden, and Soundgarden seemed like a really good fit, largely because of their Zeppelin uh, worshipping roots. But according to Slash in his book, he said that Soundgarden really was a band that came from a place where there was no fun to be had. And the disconnect between the two bands was best illustrated by the disastrous prank pulled during their final show together. So in Arizona in February of 1992, um, it would have been their last show supporting Guns N' Roses, at least in the U.S. So as Soundgarden played their last song, Slash, Matt, and Duff walked on stage holding three blow-up dolls. Slash, who was naked behind his, fell over and gave the crowd more of an insight into his life than he'd attended. So here's the interview with Chris Cornell where he talked about opening for Guns N' Roses and some of the weird you know, direction he was getting from their management, which he thought that Axel himself wasn't even aware of. I actually believe that it, grunge, if you want to refer to it as a genre like that, w- w- I think Guns N' Roses was one of the bands that really paved the way. I think that they were sort of the new school at, at, at their time. You know, like suddenly these guys come out and they're wearing dirty jeans and, and Jack Daniels t-shirts and their songs are nastier. Um, the singer's crazy. He's kind of scary looking. He's not really pretty. Um, you know, the guitar player, you can never see his eyes. Uh, it, they, they were they were one of the bands that kind of broke that open a little bit, where radio stations, magazines, um, MTV took a chance and said, well, we're going to play this. It's, it's like not what we're used to. And that was a stepping stone to um other bands to bands like faith no more the red hot chili peppers and then Soundgarden, and then um you know pearl jam and nirvana i really f- i feel like they were kind of along the way the thing was that the timing did take them from okay we're just kind of a filthy rock band in hollywood now we're successful it took them to stadiums with giant inflatable things <laughs> and you know two <laughs> keyboard players and background singer and, and big it, they they sort of slipped into what the old school thing was live kind of but still i mean they were they were definitely new and they didn't go away i mean i think they themselves sort of created a situation where they went away because they're not making records but you know the, they didn't lose their fans that's for sure and and they treated us really great the thing that was interesting for me was just seeing you know where a rock band at that point could go and seeing Soundgarden sort of on its way up and and going out on that tour and realizing this is this is one of the possible uh, scenarios scenarios of where we could go and and we all just kind of looked at each other and thought um, you know this, I don't think this is us <laughs> um, and so in that way it was helpful <laughs> that you didn't want to have big inflatable things at a Soundgarden show no probably not <laughs> it, it didn't it didn't really just it just didn't fit the band. And, you know, the weird Axel stories, it it almost has more to do with the people that that were like his handlers or his management or people that surrounded him that would kind of try to, um, you know, keep him from knowing about things and, you know, worry about how he would respond to stuff in that way. And that sort of ridiculous kind of rock world way, you know, things that we all make fun of to this day. 
that that was the weirder part. It was the way people treated him, or and the things they wouldn't do or wouldn't say to him that were the weirdest part of it. It's like a living Spinal Tap. The movie is still. <laughs> yeah, apropos kind of. this many years later. Yeah, and the, the first day that the, there were long sort of catwalks on the stage, and uh, you know it was an enormous aluminum stage, and there were three of these long catwalks that went out into the audience, and they told me, you know, there are teleprompters at the end of each one. That's where lyrics are scrolled, and also you're not allowed to go on them ever. <laughs> you can't touch the prompters, but you can't even walk out on the catwalks. And I thought, well, really. If if we don't if we don't go out on these, we're never even going to see a, a person in the audience because it was like forty feet away, um, and I thought it was silly. So the very first song of the very first show we opened, I went out onto each one, decidedly <laughs> couldn't really even hear what was going on behind me, and wa- and stood on the prompter, and then walked back and went to the middle one, and went out there and just kind of marked my territory, like guess who's going to go out and do this whenever I want. And, <laughs> They were fine with it, but then I realized that it, 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 these are like weird rules that management came up with. It had nothing to do with anyone else. And that happens when a band gets really big. You have to be careful of um, what's happening around you because people will make decisions for you or present to you, um, present you to other people in a way that you're not. So years later, Chris Cornell looked back on the tour with Guns N' Roses. So in 2012, he said, without saying anything negative about Axel, what I remember the most was Duff and Slash and everyone else being regular, sweet, warm guys in a rock band that just wanted to play rock music. And then like there was this Wizard of Oz character behind the curtain that seemed to complicate what was the most ideal situation they could have ever been in. They were the most successful and famous rock band on the planet, and every single show, hundreds of thousands of fans just wanted to hear songs. For some reason, there seemed to be this obstacle in just going out and participating in that. That is what I remember the most. It's sad. So Slash, in an interview from around the same time, put it more simply, Soundgarden, he said, came from a place where there was no fun to be had while rocking. It was clear to Slash, Duff, and Matt, at least, that they needed some rock and roll accompaniment on tour. So Alternative Nation published a three-part series detailing Soundgarden's uh, first time visiting England during their prime years. So they talked about in the summer of 1992, Spin Magazine put Chris Cornell on the front cover, and the photo had been taken with Cornell shirtless, as he had always been back then, and then screaming into the lens. The subheadline was basically pure hyperbole genius. Seattle spawned it, Madonna wants it, and Soundgarden's Chris Cornell has it. They were, of course, talking about grunge, which had exploded worldwide that year. Nirvana were touring in support of Nevermind. Pearl Jam had 10, and Soundgarden had their breakthrough, Bad Motor Finger. And, of course, Alice in Chains were out touring on Dirt. Now, Soundgarden had an opportunity to tour the U.S. and Europe uh, with Guns N' Roses, who were supporting the Use Your Illusion records. Now, the U.S. tour was a success, and Soundgarden's European adventure kicked off in May of 1992 with Guns N' Roses. So GNR's Paris show was a, basically a pay-per-view event that would include the support bands like Soundgarden. So after the Paris show, Guns N' Roses singer Axl Rose stayed up a few days straight, meaning that some shows had to be rearranged, and thus Soundgarden had a week off from tour before they hit England. The band kept themselves pretty busy by playing the infamous Pink Pop Festival in the Netherlands to an absolutely packed crowd, and this was Monday, and five days later the band were in England. So Guns N' Roses and Soundgarden were ready to perform at London's iconic Wembley Stadium, filled to the rafters with about 80,000 rock fans. Now, whilst the bulk of the fans crammed into the stadium were there for Guns N' Roses, there were some diehard fans of the Seattle Quartet pushed up towards the front. They were the ones that who had already bought, listened to, and consumed the band's latest album, Bad Motor Finger, which had been available for about nine months so far. So fame and fortune were knocking on Soundgarden's door, which had taken about eight years to arrive. But fans ingrained in the Seattle scene knew that Soundgarden were a band to basically get the ball rolling long before Nirvana had. So Soundgarden looked back on their European opening slot for Guns N' Roses with admiration, but also caution. So band member Ben Shepard would go on to say that he wanted to hate the circus that was attached to this large stadium tour, but he couldn't because the guys in the band and their crew were just too nice. Though Cornell commented decades later that everything was fine, and in particular Slash and Duff were cool to hang around with, but Axel would make things difficult. And Matt Cameron said the band had to do this tour in order to get on Lollapalooza in 1992 and make a name for themselves. So, so that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you love GNR as much as I do. And let me know if you guys were fans of Soundgarden back in the day. I didn't really get into the band until Super Unknown came out. And then down on the upside, I was a huge fan of it as well. So let me know in the comment section below. And go check us out on GNRcentral.com for the latest Guns N' Roses news. Take care.